Greetings, my fellow Virgin Islanders. I'm Senate President Novel E. Francis Jr., and it's my pleasure to bring to you this very special program that commemorates the 106th anniversary of the transfer of these islands to the United States of America. Transfer Day is a public holiday in this U.S. Virgin Islands and is observed on March 31st. The U.S. Virgin Islands hold the distinction of being the only one of the United States' five permanently inhibited territories to be purchased from another imperial power. On March 31st, 1917, the island chain comprising the Danish West Indies was purchased by the United States from Denmark for $25 million in gold, thereby becoming the U.S. Virgin Islands. In this legit TV special, we hear from various historians who share their perspective on the day that represent the birth of these islands under the United States flag. So on behalf of my colleagues of the 35th legislature, we hope you enjoy. Thank you for watching. The Virgin Islands and its people speak of great resilience. We are people rich in history and culture, struggles and triumphs in the face of disenfranchisement. March 31st, 2022 marked 104 years that the Virgin Islands of the United States have been part of the United States. Our islands were acquired by the United States in the costliest per acre sale in U.S. land purchase. We became the most easterly point of the United States and served to protect the Caribbean Basin and the Panama Canal, particularly during World War I. The Danes had entered in three separate negotiation cycles with the United States concerning the Danish West Indies. The first was in the middle 1860s after the U.S. Civil War. That first transfer negotiation collapsed due to a series of um, natural disasters that impacted the um, the American side of the negotiations. If you recall, in 1867, there was a, um, uh, an earthquake and a tsunami that literally took an American naval ship called the Nunanagila and drove it right up, took the ship and threw it into the um, downtown Christians that, I mean, Frederick said rather. And, and also, it, it showed to the American side the vulnerability of the then Virgin Islands to natural disasters. So it kind of dampened the, um, the interest due to that main reason. Uh, the second uh, transfer negotiation occurred on 1902. This time, it was the Danes who opposed the, uh, the sale. Uh, they had a vote in their parliament and they opposed the sale. And in the third attempt, the U.S. in essence told the Danes they had to sell the Virgin Islands for 25 million in bullion, gold bullion. It's not $25 million in gold bullion, which means that in today's dollars, it's worth over a billion dollars. In that third negotiation, um, uh, it was in essence a transfer of sovereignty from Denmark to the United States. And the people of Russians were not involved in the sale. It would be the Danish government negotiating with the United States government and that led to the transfer in um, 1917. Well, the transfer of the Danish West Indies was an interest for the United States uh, for a number of years. Uh, most people know about the 1917 event, but it actually um, that was just the culmination of a number of years of the United States working towards the purchase of the Danish West Indies. Um, we actually have historical records that will show that during the administration of President Abraham Lincoln, that the United States had an interest in purchasing the Danish West Indies at that time um, from the kingdom. Um, but there were a number of you know, varying factors, both economics and weather, environmental issues, that did ultimately prevent that from happening until 1916, when the actual agreement was concluded, the actual you know, transfer was done, and then the ceremonial process, the hanging over of the islands took place on that you know, um, famous day, March 31st, 1917. 
Now, these islands have been uh, a wealth um, for the Kingdom of Denmark. They were a wealth of uh, resources and, you know, economics for the Kingdom of Denmark from the time they were settled in 1666. As we know, the history of these, these islands, the Danish West Indies, um, these were one of the most profitable um, region or economic regions for the Kingdom of Denmark during that history. So you had that interest in one standpoint, but what was more so the focus of acquiring the, the Danish West Indies was its military position and its strategic location. The Danish West Indies, the Virgin Islands, is at a crossroads, if you will, within the Caribbean. Um, we are at a crossroads from Europe, Africa, North America, South America, and also we are very close to the Panama Canal. And as I mentioned before, the United States had had an interest in these islands from, you know, back in the late 1800s, but during the start of World War I with Germany and the world scene, the United States was very concerned that the Kingdom of Denmark would fall to Germany, Nazi Germany. And if that happened, all her possessions, including the Danish West Indies and the Caribbean, would also become part of the holdings or the, you know, the possessions of Germany. And so America did not want that to happen at its doorsteps here in the Caribbean. And so anything else before that, you know, it was kind of like, yeah, we'll see. But with Germany on the, the war front, it was, it, was, it was of the utmost importance that the Danish West Indies be brought into, you know, American full. So that did take place. And immediately the islands were placed into the possession or stewardship of the Department of the Navy, United States Navy. And they had administration of these islands in those early start of the uh, transfer. And as the Navy did, they did what they knew to do. And that was to administer, you know, um, like a, a fleet. And so the islands really were kind of like looked at and managed like a fleet. You know, you have a fleet of warships and there's an admiral that heads it up. And that's how these islands were administered in those early years. They, there was an admiral in charge. He was the de facto governor um, for the territory. And that relationship with the Navy took place up until 1931, 32, when the administration was transferred from the United, Department of United States Navy to United States Department of Interior. Um, that's how we got under the Department of Interior. And from an administrative standpoint, we are still you know, under the Department of the Interior. So in this session, we're gonna be talking about Transfer Day, uh, which is observed in the Virgin Islands of the United States on March 31st of each year, which is an act that's codified in the Virgin Islands Code. My grandmother always said to us that she came here to the grounds that afternoon on March 31st, 1917 with her mother and gathered with the other town's residents that were behind the ropes. That would be where the Coast Guard building is presently. There was no building there. And the legislative grounds or the capital grounds were the barracks part extension of parade grounds. It is where the military did their exercises and had their drills. Because this building, which is the Capitol building today, was a barracks. This barracks was built in 1874 in collaboration with the renovations of Fort Christian that took place also in 1874. The tour down the tower similar to Black Bears and Blue Bears, Skysburg and Fredericksburg Tower. There was a tower in the not quite in the center of the courtyard, but to the north of the courtyard. So if you visit Fort Christian today, you will see the outline of that tower and the clock tower was constructed. So when they transformed that citadel into a police station, they constructed this building for the barracks for the military and they moved out of Fort Christian here. They gathered at four o'clock the afternoon. However, they were 
most likely oblivious to all of the details that were required prior to the transfer at four o'clock that afternoon. Danish and American officials had already set the date. There were previous um, activities leading up to transfer day, meaning that it had been ratified by Congress. The president's office had been quite involved. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was the president at the time. And all of the necessary preparations for the transfer of the former Danish West Indies or the Danish West Indies to the United States of America had been completed. So they had been wired uh, by telegraph that the check of $25 million to be exchanged in gold had been delivered. The sale of the Danish West Indies pulled Denmark out of depression and gave them the capital, resources, gold bullion necessary for them to become the happiest country that we know today. The brutal slavery and serf system that they inflicted on my ancestors, however, was not a happy time. During the transfer ceremonies on March 31st, 1917, the people of the Virgin Islands, my people, were citizens of no country. All four of my grandparents were alive and living on the island of St. Croix at the time of the transfer. Only qualified Danish citizens living in Denmark were able to vote in the plebiscite. Of my eight great-grandparents, I believe one may have met the land and income requirement mandatory to be able to vote. Each island had some ceremonial aspect to advise its residents and its citizens that the transfer of power to the United States took place that day. The main activities were done in the capital, Charlotte Amley St. Thomas. Danish officials gathered to the north of the building, of the complex. There was no road that came through here. This was a peninsula, so there was no highway or no roadway as you see there. And that's subject to change soon because this new highway is going to go around the peninsula. The Capitol building, the old barracks and Fort Christian sits on a peninsula and the water battery is still there. If you go outside, you'll see the cannons. We, during my tenure, I had the battery restored after hurricanes, Irma and Maria, and those cannons, um, we relocated cannons from different government facilities. They had moved them over the decades at the Department of Public Works. Government House had two. They were inappropriately placed at other government facilities. So we restored the battery. The water battery is tied to Fort Christian. So this is not a site separate and apart from Fort Christian, which is a National Historic Landmark. The Danish officials, there was a, um, a, a porch at the time, a little balcony across the, the south side of the uh, fort. If you look at pictures, you'll see a little porch a little balcony where Danish officials, people were on the roofs. Uh, people went to, to, to locations where they could look down on the battery, the barracks. And uh, people did their best to get at particular vantage points to witness this flag transfer, because basically for them it was seeing this Danaberg, which is the Danish flag, go down, which was uh, over these islands, flew over these islands for 250 years. And people say they're going to the barracks yard. They mean that this, the parking lot across the street, which they call Fort Christian, were all part of this barracks installation. The parking lot, a section of the parking lot, east of the fort had had buildings associated with this structure and Fort Christian. 
Uh, so this whole area was called the barracks yard. Uh, there was a boat house, a double boat house, which was destroyed, I think, in Hurricane Hugo, Maryland. Uh, that was to the south. That's the King's Wharf. So the King's Wharf landing is still there. You could actually go into the boundaries of the Coast Guard and you'll see that old King's Wharf. That King's Wharf was tied to the Vendors Plaza, which was underwater, which was uh, a wharf area. This is the entry port to Charlotte Omni Emancipation Garden and the fort. So it was a promenade where residents could walk, take a seat, just like we built a new highway, the Veterans Drive Highway um, Phase 1. People can now sit and have a relationship to the ocean. It was back then the same way. My grandmother, who was 17 years old at that time, she died 104, mentioned that you know where you have, but you don't know where you're getting. And she started to cry. One of the reasons is people thought they'd be citizen. So when the island was transferred, no one was citizen. Let me go further back. In 1803, Denmark passed a law or a proclamation from 1803, no longer selling slaves. But yet still, in 1917, Denmark sold people to the United States from one colonial power to the next colonial power. And that's one of the reasons my grandmother was crying, because they were not citizens. So they have to fight, fight for it to become a citizen. Ten years later, 1927, and then beyond that, 1932, well, everybody, those who were in, in the U.S. mainland or elsewhere in the world, to become citizens. A man by the name of Geraldo Gerti, a uh, historian from St. Thomas, who I guess was much more the kind of historic, cultural historian than I am, than those who I said were trained as, you know, strict uh, historians. Um, spoke a lot about what was taking place on the streets of St. Thomas during that Navy rule period. And apparently it wasn't very nice in terms of uh, these are uh, many of the officers and sailors and what that came in, usually from some of the southern states and uh, had, you know, Jim, Jim Corazon was all part of their whole way of dealing with black folks. Uh, and therefore, uh, many incidents uh, took place. And even as I grew up in St. Thomas, uh, there was still a lot of that, uh, you know, conflict between uh, the naval officers in the Virgin Islands and the, let's say, taxi drivers and whatnot. Uh, every so often you have some skirmish. So that, <clears throat> attitude of the islands is really just a place that had to be run like a navy ship as some of the you know that I've read it several places that that was the way it was suggested that the navy administrators of the island would run the islands. I don't know how many of our historians have looked at even and emphasized the fact that one of the oppositions to moving forward a treaty was that there were people in Denmark, and I'm not here being an apologist for it, for the Danish people, but that there were people in Denmark which had its own agrarian kind of conflicts, right, with Lee Hamilton Jackson, how he aligned himself with journalism and whatnot, that um, there is quite possible that there was significant humanistic involvement that said, these people, we selling them off, but at least they should have a vote. And if they can't have a vote, then no treaty. Great grandparents, aunts, uncles, my family, were citizens of no country, nowhere for 10 years. When you look at United States development and its states, and those states that were former territories, it does not typically take 
a hundred years for a territory to be incorporated into the United States. The Bambula is important because it actually clears the way for meetings or um, debates, celebrations, uh, mornings. Um, so when we think about Bambula, we can't think just about a dance. We have to think about the whole aspect in a whole. It is the movement, it is the rhythm, it is the song. So with Bambula, it opens up all of our aspects of spirituality within our community. How did we come together as a people, Bambula? The playing the drums is a call to gather together. And so the bula was one of the first drums for the bambula. Of course, then you had something called, the dance is called what? Bambula. But it, but it trends and is rooted from the bula, which is the drum. It's a bamboo drum with skins on the both sides and it's played. When I was growing up and I was in elementary school, this was the 70s, mid 70s, uh, early 80s, culture was embedded in our curriculum. There was not a year that we did not participate in food fair, the parade, it had culture day at, in the carnival, you had donkey races, you had different things, you had the doll competitions. Every aspect of culture and who we were and who we are was within our curriculum. They taught us sewing, crocheting, where they taught us letter making, anything you could do with your hand that was a craft or a trade, we learned in school. And that was part of our culture, part of who we are. So when this aspect was taken away, who did we turn, who did we turn into? Who did we become? We lost ourselves along the way. And by putting Bambola back in the forefront, this is who we are, this is us. I see that as the important aspect of making sure that Bambula is within the transfer day. It's because we did have grievances. We were not happy, we were not represented. We did not have a choice. So by placing Bambula at the forefront of transfer day, shows and gives respect to our ancestors that actually lived during that time and did not have a say. We have a say. It is about time we say it. History isn't always what is written on a piece of paper. History is the movement, the song, the art, how we express ourselves. What kind of grievances that we have. Is our music, our dance, our rhythm. The drum is our heartbeat. We always say the heartbeat connects us to Africa. The drum connects us to our spirituality. Bambula is the way that we connect to our history. It is significant because without knowing who we are, who are we today and who are we going to be tomorrow? Bambula makes sure that we understand. It is a form of belonging, a self-awareness of identity. The Caribbean identity has been smothered we are a very unique and proud people. We come together from different areas, different aspects, and we combine to create and to express ourselves through art. You can write anything on a piece of paper, but when you dance and you sing and you play, that's from the heart. Bambola within the school system is critical because it's teaching the actual local version of history. So rethinking the native narrative is Bambula. When we place Bambula back in the school system, we are recreating what was lost. We are introducing who we are back into our community. So as we rethink the native narrative, we must reteach how we are seen as a people, a Caribbean people, indigenous, or non-indigenous to these islands. What is our connection to our surroundings? 
How did we get here? How did we feel? How did it affect us? That is what Bambola does when we teach it within the school system. It gives the native aspects, the native songs, the native stories coming from us and not other entities that might have corrupted the identity of who we are. With my experiences with the elders here in the Virgin Islands, a majority of them agree with the fact that Transfer Day should not be celebrated by the locals because we did not have a choice. We didn't have a decision. We were literally just left out in a cold. The, their homes were just sold, the island itself, up on them. So they feel that they were betrayed. Who are they? And then back to the identity. They, I, my opinion, and my mom's opinion, and I agree, they felt like squatters. They had no home, they own it. How come we didn't own it? We were living here. All of a sudden, you know, one owner wants to sell it to another owner. Do we all have a say? So I can see how they feel. I can see the grievances in having your home taken away from you and your identity taken away from you. Because for 10 whole years, who were they? They were just there on the island. How would you feel if you did not know your future? Where was I going to be? How was I going to, you know, support my family? It goes back to how their identity was ripped away from them. How they were suppressed as a people. And I will say once more again, that reflected it a lot of in their music of the time. A lot of rebellious music. A lot of rebellion uh, going out and dancing and doing things that they wasn't supposed to be doing. The disenfranchisement and unequal treatment of people in the Virgin Islands is de jure law. The insular cases decided at the turn of the century and Plessy versus Ferguson era Supreme Court established a doctrine of separate and unequal status for overseas territories. However, the disenfranchisement and unequal treatment continues today. Through court cases in the Bush, Obama, Trump and now Biden administration through their oral and written arguments to the Supreme Court, as well as my own colleagues, Congress's unwillingness to grant equal treatment requests made by representatives from the territory. My fight in Washington has been to level and create equity, to counter the many ways that such disenfranchisement affects our lives, federal funding, healthcare access, veterans' benefits, structural damage after natural disasters due to longstanding unequitable funding. It's my deepest honor to be grounded by my history, my parents and my ancestors from the Virgin Islands, many of whom have played an integral role in the history of this nation long even before we were a part of this country. From Denmark Vesey, leader of the Charleston, South Carolina Slave Revolt, David Levy Yuli, the first Jewish senator in the United States, Williams Leisdorf, the founder of San Francisco, Edward Wilmot Blyden, one of the founders of Liberia. Even today, my predecessor, the first female physician of this body as a member of Congress, Donna Christensen, and even this weekend, NCAA women's basketball champion, Aaliyah Boston. Our contributions to this nation are undisputed. And 104 years after our transfer from Denmark to the U.S. possession, our claim to full and inviolable rights as citizens of this country are long overdue.